Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10. The third book of the Pentateuch. Leviticus 10. This is not a much used book, uh, but it's a very good book, Leviticus is. The emphasis in this book um, you're going to find is on holiness. God's interested in holiness. Now, because I didn't write these down, I'm going to need help. So, I'll assign some verses. Leviticus chapter 11, verse 44. Who wants to get that one? Okay? Leviticus 11:45. Who's got that one? Rachel? Leviticus 19:21. Camden? Leviticus 20, verse 7. Amy? Leviticus 20, verse 26. Am I going to get that? Jan? 20, 26. Okay. In Leviticus 9, verse 44. Who's got the first one? Leviticus 11, 44. Okay, so he made it clear. You're supposed to be holy. Let's go to the next verse. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Hmm, he thinks we're hard of hearing. Uh, next one, 1921. And he shall bring his trespass offering unto the Lord, unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, even a ram for a trespass offering. Okay. Hello. Um, 20 verse 7 who's got that one okay okay he's making his point verse 7 oh, you just did 7 verse 26 mm -hmm. and you shall be holy unto me for I the Lord am holy and have severed you from other people that you should be mine in this book there, there's a repetition that you start getting used to. And what you'll see is the word holy. 94 times the word holy pops up. He <coughs> intends you to take note of holiness. This book is all about, Leviticus is all about how to be holy because you don't know on your own. You may have your own idea of how to be holy, but God's going to give you his idea in this book, what God considers holy. Uh, it's an emphasis on abstaining from evil in this book and abstaining from appearance of evil. God goes one step farther than what man would do. Man says, I'll abstain from evil, but I'm just going to act like it. I'm going to go right as close as I can to the line without stepping over. God says, no, don't even go near it. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And that's what the book will show you. You see, there's a lot of sacrifices that are given in this book. Lots of them. Lots of animals. You bring an animal for this. You bring this animal for this. You bring two or three different type of animals. All the animals that you'll bring are non-carnivorous. That is, they don't eat other animals. They could be pets. They're tame animals. So, so was Jesus Christ when he came. He was not carnivorous. He didn't come down here killing anybody. He didn't do like the Muslims do, convert or I cut your head off. That's our sacrifice. Our sacrifice was meek and lowly. There's 24,546 words in the book. I didn't count those. I'm taking somebody else's word for that. <laughs> but 87 times you see the word blood. Holiness and blood are words that you will just see repeatedly. They kept popping up in the book. Another one is uh, 87 times the word holiness. Atonement, 45 times. Those are all good Bible terms you need to know. Blood is important to God if it's the right kind. The wrong kind of blood, he can't stand. Um, so, chapter 10 is where we are tonight. Leviticus 10. Leviticus 10, verse 1. These are Aaron's sons, his two sons, and Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron. 
took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. Okay, there's a way you have to serve God and it's not the way you make up, not the way you think he will like. Now we can do that with humans. With humans, we can give them a gift we think they'll like. Now they may or may not like it and they'll just appreciate that we did something for them or not. But with God, he won't accept something unless he's already put it on his wish list. The Bible is a wish list of what God will accept and what he will not. So we've got to get exactly what he'll accept. Nadab and Abihu decided they would come up with their own religion. You know, why get the fire off of the altar? That's a perpetual fire that was supposed to be there and continually burning. Well, they said, well, you know, we're always doing that. Let's just do it our own way. This is easy. And that's the key to most religion is what's easy. It's not about that. It's about what God will accept. Strange fire in the Bible here was a fire that was not kindled from the, kindled from the brazen altar. That's the altar that sat outside the, the tabernacle. Uh, you find that in Leviticus 9, verse 24, and chapter 16, verse 12. The type is that someone praying to God on any basis other than the shed blood because they killed the offering and then burn it in the fire. That, what was burnt, was what could be eaten by the priests. That fire was what God would accept. You couldn't just build your own. You couldn't do your own thing. In Leviticus 9, 24, he said, and there, came out, uh, and there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which all the people saw, and they shouted and fell on their faces. God accepts certain things and certain things he doesn't. Now, he made it apparent in the Old Testament when he accepted something. You'll remember Gideon. He says, look, okay, this angel's coming down here telling me I'm going to be the leader and I don't believe it, but let me go ahead and offer you something. And then he saw the fire come down and eat it, took it up. So he knew that was a sign. He was a Jew. They needed a sign. So he knew, okay, the fire fall, fell from heaven and devoured it. I know that was really God. Repeatedly you see that. In Leviticus 16, 12, it says, And he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from off the altar before the Lord, and his hand full, hands full of sweet incense beaten small, and bring it within the veil. There was something that fire was for. That fire was intended to be part of the process for what the priest got to bring in to the most holy place. So, you can't just cook up your own system. And that's what Nadab and Abihu decided they were going to do. And God didn't like it one bit, and he killed them for it. Now, it's a good thing he's not doing that right now. Right now, he just destroys people's lives for it. But he could, he could decide, okay, you've not done what I've told you, and I gave you my word, and I told you what makes me happy and what doesn't, and you won't do it, so I'll kill you. He could. By and large, he doesn't. He just lets your life head the same direction you want it to go. In Leviticus 10, verse 6. God killed Aaron's two sons. Then he says, Leviticus 10, 6. And Moses said unto Aaron, and unto Eleazar, and unto Ithamar, his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither rend your clothes, lest ye die, and lest wrath come upon all the people, but let your brethren, the whole house of Israel, bewail the burning which the Lord hath kindled. Okay, Aaron and his sons are not allowed to mourn the death of Aaron's two sons that just died. Why? Because it was the wrath of God. He says, I don't want you throwing a pity party because the people will see that and they'll say, trying to console you, they'll say that was very mean of God. He said, let them just mourn on their own. The way that, that I afflict and show them sorrow is fine for them, but I don't want you instigating it. Okay, so that's tough. So if we see the wrath of God fall, like an Orlando nightclub with a bunch of homosexuals, both parties are anti-God. Both the Muslim and the homosexual. Both of them are anti-God. 
Romans chapter 1, uh, Genesis chapter 19, uh, Judges chapter 19. There's a host of verses on it. Both of them are avowed enemies of God. If God's wrath falls on those places, we're not to get involved in the mourning for it. That's tough. God asks us to do some things that are hard. That's just the way it is. Read Leviticus, you'll get a good picture of who he is and what he can do, and you just say, yes, sir. <laughs> Leviticus 10, verse 9. Leviticus 10, verse 9. He says, Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee, when you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest you die. That's pretty tough. He said, you're going to be drinking? I'll just kill you. This is God talking. Uh, I don't think I would risk it. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. Now, a lot of people are going to say, oh, that's Old Testament, we're in the New Testament now. Okay, explain to me what forever means. <laughs> Unless you've got a verse to say, I've changed it, you better go with what he said in the Old Testament. Unless you've got something in the New Testament that says, this is a new way to do this, you better obey it. Remember, breathing started in the Old Testament. We're still doing that. <laughs> uh, Leviticus, where are we? Uh, 10, 10, 10. He says, and that you may put difference between holy and unholy, and between clean and uh, between unclean and clean. So he's saying alcohol is unholy and unclean. That's God's word. That's what God said. Now, find any place in the Bible where he said otherwise. Just That'll be a homework project for you. Okay? So, that's a good idea to just abstain from alcohol. Amen. Period. And you got good Bible grounds for it. Unless you can show me something where it says, alcohol, drink it up, buddy. <laughs> then you better stay away from it, because I can show you many places where he says, don't do it. Furthermore, in this passage, these were priests now, but if you're saved, he's made you a priest. You're a priest in God's sense. In the New Testament church, we are the priests to God. So, because of that, we better not be drinking alcohol. In 1 Corinthians 3... First Corinthians three verse sixteen. I don't know why this is so hard tonight, but man, we got some tough passages. First Corinthians three sixteen. I thought this was going to be Joel Osteen night. Huh? <laughs> First Corinthians three sixteen. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man is that me, that is wicked. <laughs> If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. That doesn't sound real pleasant, does it? Him will God destroy. Um, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. So he said, your body that I let, let you walk around in, that thing I consider holy because I purchased it. If God owns it, it's holy. It's his. He says, if you're going to destroy that thing, I'll destroy you. So, no brainer. Stay away from alcohol. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. 1 Peter 2, verse 5. He says, ye also... As lively stones are built up a spiritual house, as in the house of God. And holy priesthood, that's what God considers you, a part of the priesthood, a holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. So you need to find out what sacrifices are acceptable and which ones are not. Because Nadab and Abihu broke the rules and it didn't turn out too well. 
Okay, Leviticus 11. Leviticus 11. Now, I've read this passage, I see, at least, at least 100, maybe 200 times. And not till this past year have I slowed down and really noticed it. I mean, I've, I've thought something was odd about it before, but not really slowed down and looked at it. Leviticus 11, 13. And these are they which ye shall have in an abomination, in abomination among the flow, fowl. Okay, so he's saying there's certain birds that God doesn't like. They're unclean. Um, now, I'm not saying he doesn't like them. I, I mean, for specific purposes. We're talking about eating here. Here's going to list them. They shall not be eaten. They are an abomination. The eagle. Okay, bald eagle is an unclean animal. The eagle. The osprey, the osprey, the vulture, the kite after his kind, every raven after his kind, the owl, the nighthawk, the cuckoo, and the hawk after his kind. That's verse 16, Leviticus 11:16. And the little owl, and the cormorant, and the great owl. That's all good reading, isn't it? Verse 18, and the swan, and the pelican, and, their e and the gear eagle, and the stork, the heron after the, her kind, and the lapwing, and the bat. Okay, that's a bunch of animals to stay away from. So when you're having Thanksgiving dinner, don't cook any of those. I don't think anybody's doing that anyway, but just keep it in mind. Don't cook any of those. Those are not something that God considers good enough to eat. Now... Peter, in the New Testament, gets a revelation that things that were unclean animals are now clean animals. You can't eat them if you follow two rules. Sanctify them by prayer and the Word of God. So God can cleanse something if you don't have anything else to eat. God can cleanse it. But they picture something. An unclean animal in the Old Testament pictures something spiritually unclean. And you'll see it all the way through the Bible. So an unclean animal in the Old Testament is going to picture something unclean in the spirit world. Look at verse 20. All fowls that creep, so all birds that creep, like what's a bird that creeps? A, um, what's the big thing with the, the feathers that are the colorful feathers? A peacock. A peacock creeps. It walks on its feet. Chicken. Okay, ostrich, turkey. turkey. Well, yeah, turkey. They do fly, but they, they're creepy too. Um, <laughs> they creep. They walk on their feet. Let's keep reading. Going on all fours. How many birds do you know with four legs? None. He's talking about unclean fowl. There's some unclean fowl that you haven't seen yet, and they're coming. Um shall be an abomination unto you. The unclean birds are types of unclean spirits. Matthew 12, verse 24. Matthew 12, 24. 12, 24. Matthew 12, 24. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of devils. Okay, so they recognize there's something going on in the spirit realm that affects what we know in reality. And that's absolutely true. Now, they got the interpretation totally wrong. <laughs> but they did understand a fact. What's going on in the spirit realm is also affecting what happens in the physical realm. The two intersect. Mark chapter 4, verse 4. Mark 4, verse 4. This is the sower and the seed, and we're just going to break into the middle of him talking here and pick up some ideas. Mark 4, 4. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Okay, we saw in the Old Testament there were some unclean fowls. He said the word of God is like this. I sow it. 
And when I do, the fowls come and grab it. Let's get an explanation. Verse 15, Mark 4, 15. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. He just explained to you who the fowl there was. It was the devil, Satan. Okay, that's an unclean bird. Let's find the unclean bird with four legs. Revelation 18. Revelation 18, 2. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every fowl, as in a bird, spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's how he describes the unclean spirits, as a bird. Revelation chapter 9. Revelation 9, verse 1. Revelation 9, 1, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Okay, that's hell. Somebody got a key to hell, and he's going to open it up. You're going to find out what's there. Verse 2. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Drop down to verse 7. Some things are coming out, out of the pit. And the shape, shape of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And their heads were as, the, uh, as it were crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. And they had hair as the hair of women. And their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates as it were the breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings... Okay, so these things have four legs because they're like a horse. And they have wings like a fowl. And the uh, sound of their wings of, of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions. And uh, there were stings in their tails. And, they had, and their power was uh, to hurt men five months. So there's some crazy creatures in hell... And one day they're coming up, and one of the things that he's told us about that's going to come up is a four-legged fowl. We've not seen one yet. But he told you all the way back in the third book of the Old Testament, stay away from unclean animals and four-legged fowls. Interesting. It's there. Um, it took me a while to actually track it down, but sometimes you do that. You see something odd in your reading, you should. And you just make a note. Maybe you got time to research it, maybe you don't. But at some point, you'll need to go back and look those things up. Leviticus chapter 14. Leviticus 14, 14. Leviticus 14, 14 says, And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the put and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. Okay, this is important, else he would not have said it. Right. We need to observe it, and we need to make note of it. A lot of things in the Bible, you read and you think, man, that's just monotonous. That doesn't make any sense to me, and why do I need to know all those details? Because God said it. That's all. That's all. You don't need to, you don't need to um, necessarily have some supernatural um, great feeling when you read it. <laughs> Just he said it, appreciate it. He didn't have to say anything to us. But he put those words down, so let's read them. Now, this is the same place, uh, the same placement as the blood for Aaron and his sons. You find that in Leviticus 8.23. Leviticus 8, 23. So this is a trespass offering. The person making the trespass offering 
is doing this. And they're getting this blood put on all these spots, the right ear and the, the thumb and the big toe. But so did Aaron. Leviticus 8.23 And he slew it, and Moses took the blood of it and put it upon the tip of Aaron's right ear and upon the thumb of his right hand and upon the great toe of his right foot. Okay, those are all good things. Now, we can take some spiritual application from that. Now, I'm not talking doctrinal, but we can take some spiritual application from that. Spiritually, you should walk in the right place, in a place where the blood of God would feel comfortable because, after all, that's what's running through your spirit is the blood of God. He purchased you with his own blood. Okay, there's certain places that you should walk. There's certain things you should handle. The right thumb. There's certain things that you should listen to. The right ear. Don't just listen to anything. You should judge what you hear because you're allowing it to enter into the temple of God. What did he say about something that defiles it? I'll destroy that man. If you allow something to enter your ears that defiles the temple of God, he does not like it. Man, why are we so hard tonight? I don't know. Look at, <laughs> look at Leviticus 8, uh, 24. Leviticus 8, 24. And he brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put the blood upon the tip of their right ear, and upon the thumbs of their right hands, and upon the great toes of their uh, right feet, and Moses sprinkled uh, the blood upon the altar round about. Blood is everywhere. Now, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's good stuff. Amen. Now, the right blood will do something powerful. That blood has the ability to do something no other blood could do. I had, um, I smashed my finger, did something to my finger today, and it bled, and it bled on something I was working on. Now, fortunately, it just cleaned up. But normally what blood does is it stains. You know what the blood of Jesus Christ does? Is it's a cleaning agent. It doesn't do what our blood does because our blood's tainted. The blood of Jesus Christ is a cleansing agent and it cleans you. It's a detergent. Uh, in Exodus 9, uh, 29, verse 20. Exodus 29, 20. God's serious about this blood business. Exodus 29, 20. Then shalt thou kill the ram, and take of his blood, and put it upon the tip of the right ear of Aaron, and upon the tip of the right ear of his sons, and upon the thumb of their right hand, and upon the great toe of the right foot, and sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. He keeps saying it. It must mean something. So we better appreciate it. <laughs> Whether you understand it or not, you should just appreciate it. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 5. The blood was used to cleanse. Innocent blood was used to cleanse a person from any transgression all throughout the Old Testament. Jesus Christ's blood, which was innocent blood, is used to cleanse you and I. Isaiah 1, verse 5. Why should you be stricken any more? Will you revolt more and more? The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. Okay, somebody needed some blood. <laughs> when you find yourself about to faint, your whole head is sick, things don't make sense, okay, get some blood. Ask God for the blood of Jesus Christ to cleanse your thoughts and your actions. Ask him to. That's what it's there for. It's always at the throne of God right now. It's waiting there. Now, you were saved by it, but you need to be further purified by it. This didn't just happen once in the Old Testament. They continually had to have these blood offerings. You continually need to be cleansed because you're continually getting filthy. <laughs> So just, you're not getting saved again. You're getting cleansed. Just say, God, I don't know what's going on. I need some blood poured down on me that will purify this wickedness out of me. And he'll give it to you. It's what it's there for. It's powerful. Romans chapter 6, verse 19.
Romans 6, back up to verse 13 first. We've got to get a 13 in here. We just love that number. <laughs> Romans 6, 13. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. It's a choice. You choose. You get the say in it. Now, I don't know why God leaves it up to us to make a decision. <laughs> because we keep making the wrong ones. But he does. He does. He says, you learn it. Figure it out. I'm just telling you right now, don't make the wrong one. Yield yourself, your members, that's the members of your body, your fingers, your toes, your ears, your hand. You know, we read about the right ear, the right thumb, the right toe, all that stuff. Those all needed blood. They all need to be yielded to be made holy. Look at verse 19. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness unto, our word, holiness. Okay. If you ran for the devil, and you ran hard for the devil, you sure be, better be able to run hard for God. That's the next lie the devil gives you if you want to quit his wickedness. Is, well, just don't do it fanatical. Okay, you can get right, but let's just ease into this thing. No, sir. If you can run hard for the devil, you can run hard for God. I mean, who's worth more? Is God worth more than the devil? And you ran how hard for the devil? Then you ought to be able to run harder for God. Romans 12, verse 1. Romans 12, 1. He says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now, isn't that good? <laughs> mercies. Okay, he's going to ask you to do something big. This verse is going to ask you to do something major. That's why he prefaces it with mercies. So there's some mercy from God available for whatever this chore is. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Here's our word, holy, acceptable unto God. And by the way, this is just your reasonable service. <laughs> but guess what? God gives you some extra grace just to, just to decide you're going to do what you should have already been doing anyway. <laughs> Good stuff. 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. He says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved. Okay, the whole book is full of promises. The Bible is one promise after the next. Now, sometimes the promise is, If you do this, I'll destroy you. <laughs> but that's still a promise. There's a blessing in that. If all you see is the negative, you're wicked. The, the positive in that is I don't have to do that, and I won't get destroyed. Make it positive. <laughs> he says, uh, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. That's the problem. The filth of the flesh does not stay in the flesh. It defiles the spirit. Perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Okay, get some fear of God. That helps you get holiness. He says it perfects. So, it's not a one-time deal. We're ne we've never arrived. <laughs> you think, okay, finally. You know, I've overcome these issues here. Now I'm holy. Okay, God will let you enjoy that for about five minutes. <laughs> But you're always perfecting holiness. You should be moving on to something, something else he wants for you. It's a continual process. Philippians chapter 1 verse 20. Philippians 1 20. According to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness, as always, 
so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Okay, that's what's supposed to happen. Our body, the one who, this body has a mind of its own. <laughs> it wants to do wickedness. It wants to do um, anything but what God wants it to. And when I say wickedness, I don't necessarily mean something horrible. I just mean something God didn't intend you to do. If God intended you to be reading your Bible, the wicked thing the flesh might want you to do is just take a nap. That doesn't sound real wicked, does it? But if it's avoiding something God intends you to do, it's wicked. 1 Peter chapter 1. First Peter 1 Peter 1.14. You didn't know you were going to get so much church age doctrine out of Leviticus, did you? <laughs> First Peter 1 Peter 1.14 As obedient children, not fashioning ourselves according to the former lust uh, in your ignorance. <laughs> okay. So if you've gotten saved, you understand something. You understand you were ignorant prior to getting saved. Okay, that was stupid to not get saved. Now you are saved. Okay, so don't live like the idiot you knew before. <laughs> so in order to do that, you can't continue fashioning yourself according to what was pleasing to the flesh before. Now you've got to put on a fashion show. You fashion yourself for righteousness. Put on a godly fashion show. Get the garments God wants you to have. 1 Peter 1.15 but as he which call, hath called you is holy, there's our word, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Boy, that hurts. All manner of conversation. If your mouth opens, it should be holy. I didn't say it, God did. Because he's yelling at me too. <laughs> all things that come out of your mouth should be holy, says God. Look at the next chapter, chapter 2, verse 5. Uh, we already covered this verse, but here he's saying you're a holy priesthood. Well, it wouldn't look too good if a priest were not speaking holiness, <laughs> were speaking things that were vile. You wouldn't see them around very long. You know what would have happened to them in the Old Testament? Well, we got Nadab and Abihu to prove it. They'd have been slaughtered. Uh, Dathan, uh, Dathan and Abiram got killed too so if you can't control your conversation guess what you got wrath coming so here he's saying you're a priest so I expect certain things of you that I don't expect of the world now there were some wicked Israelites too there were some mixed multitude that were wicked too but God didn't destroy them he destroyed the priest class who were supposed to know and do better. So, yeah, we get punished at a harsher rate than the wicked world because it's only fair. We're getting something way better. <laughs> Look at chapter 2, verse 9, 1 Peter 2, 9. It says, But ye are chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay, now you got some self-esteem back. <laughs> You're something special. You are. According to God, you are something special. There it is. But he requires you to act like it. <laughs> Look at uh, verse 10. Verse 10. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So use it. <laughs> You're, you're going to need mercy to accomplish the things God intends. He intends you to be holy. But guess what? That ain't a practice that you just snap your fingers and it happens. You're going to need some mercy. Oh, I knew better than doing that. I did it again. Mercy. He'll give it because you're special. Special. Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Revelation 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and first begotten of the dead, 
and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That's pretty good. That's what all that blood in the Bible is all about. Because that blood will get rid of sin. Well, dump a load right here. <laughs> that's what he's doing. All right, that's uh, probably as far as we can get tonight, and we'll pick up there next time.